All right, good afternoon for Tuesday, November 10th. Welcome everybody that are in here. I see we're missing quite a few. And James, good to be in here, James Meek, and uh, all of you, good to see those are in attendance. So um, we're kind of dwindling in the class here. I know some uh, can't make it, they go see the recordings. And uh, we've had a few uh, actually drop out of the class. So uh, congratulations to you uh, that are either listening to the recording or here with a, a live session. You've made it into week number four. So moving through it, just about halfway through. And you guys are doing good. And uh, a lot of information, a lot of new information coming. Some, some new information coming at you. Uh, some probably have heard before. And hopefully all around it's informative uh, informative class all right we've had a couple issues as we start moving through this um, through this class uh, with technical issues with uh, mainly with the uh, uh, the map importing the map which I've never experienced before in the years of doing this so I'm not quite sure what's going on um, I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb today. Um, I'm actually going to do a demonstration of it and see if it works. I don't know if something's changing in technology. Here's what I'm receiving. So with the class that we still, with students that are still in class, with uh, all you students, all of you, um, I am receiving uh, maps. And some of them are in place. Um, JPEGs that are in place. They open up uh, in a, they're in the PDF and they open up in AutoCAD. Uh, some of them I'm receiving as JPEGs, not opening, uh, not attached in um, AutoCAD and attached in the PDF. And then some of you are still sending in uh, what is uh, not a JPEG. Um, I'm getting variations and getting certain things happening, certain things not. Um, I don't know if Kevin is in here or not. Let me take a look. Yes, Kevin's in here. He was helpful yesterday. And Kevin, to let you know, I tried. Um, yes, hi, Kevin. Uh, I tried um, what you recommended yesterday as far as uh, the pathway, and I couldn't get that to work. So I might be doing something wrong on my end so we might review that as well today um, as we get to that so i want to review that first on the on the mapping portion i, I think everybody has down the scaling portion and uh, importing the map but something is happening with some things um let's see uh javier is not in here um he was having an issue with uh with some of that but plus is PDF on one of his files was completely black, um, just solid black across there. And so I emailed back to him and I said, make sure um, I noticed he wasn't using on the cat file. I noticed he wasn't using multiple layers. He had some layers, but not um, not enough corresponding to his drawing. So that might be one thing uh, when converting to JPEG is it's not reading the layers uh, correctly because what's happening when you, there is a way to not use layers. So you have three layers and about 15, 20 different items that should be on separate layers. You can change the color of an item on, let's say, a zero white layer, um, as you already know. You probably already know this. So now it's trying to read a zero layer with different colors and line types, maybe, or whatever the, whatever the uh, property change was on it. And I, just guessing that might have been confusing on a on a, on a uh, JPEG or on a, on a PDF. I'm not sure when it was converted. Um, also, he might have a um, issue with the file itself. There may be a, maybe a corrupt file. Uh, so um, when you guys hit a wall like that, experiment around a little bit. Uh, one thing it would be to uh, go ahead um, for Javier to make sure he makes additional layers, or for anybody. Um, that's listening you might have you have run into that problem either now or in the future uh, make sure you have individual layers you're still running into that of course there's always the shutdown and reboot of everything right um, that's one of the first things uh, shutting down AutoCAD and reopening AutoCAD step one 
step two, shutting down everything and rebooting uh, is another way. <laughs> James makes a layers of friends. James, did, you didn't have me in the intro class. That's one of my famous lines in in uh, in my intro classes about layers when I, especially when I introduce them, because uh, I get that look when it's face to face. Of course, I get that look that people are like, "Why do I have to deal with layers? I can change colors of anything I want." And I go, "Layers are your friends. <laughs> Use them. It's used in industry. Get used to them. It sounds like a pain, uh, but they end up being your friend." Thanks, James, for that supporting comment on that. I appreciate it, James Meeks. So yes, absolutely. So those are the couple of things that you might uh, go ahead and try if you're running into problems. The other thing, if it's, a file, if it's a corrupt file, you can try this and it doesn't always work, but you can turn everything on um, with proper layers, everything on that you want to copy and paste into another file. If you uh, know how to view two um, Two CAD files at the same time or multiple CAD files at the same time and copy and paste in into those. So um, a brand new one. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. There was something sometimes embedded in the drawing somehow, something got corrupted. Um, sometimes it, if you're importing blocks uh, from an unknown site, uh, that's why I was very cautious on that one link, even though, even though it was through Autodesk uh, for blocks, I was still a little bit cautious, and I forgot who in here, I think James Meek, I think it was you who tried it out first. <laughs> Thanks, James, for experimenting. I threw the guinea pig on that. And uh, James is still alive, and his computer is still running, so I guess that link was was all good. And um, I did send it over to my brother. I hadn't heard back if he had used that. There was some free blocks for plants. So uh, it could be something that got corrupted that way. Uh, sometimes when you copy and paste a drawing, from one file into another, it doesn't cure that, um, but sometimes it does. So that's experimental, but I want you guys to be able to, kind of, I guess I use the term, think outside the box. So, so if you're in industry or um, working at a, at a job and you run into problems, you don't want to run to the uh, boss or your next direct um, every five minutes and, and say, hey, how come my PDF is black, you know? And, uh, try some of these things and you'll be, um, you either will be a hero for others that run into the same problem or you'll be a hero to yourself that you figured it out. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever feel it. Maybe it's just me. But when I conquer something, when I figure something out, uh, when I have the time to research it and Google it and, and I finally understand the directions on a YouTube or whatever it is, I feel pretty good about it. And it actually reinforces uh, my memory on that because I had to concentrate so hard on that. Um, James Meek says, remember, whoops, couldn't quite read it fast enough. Remember, white layers turn black in paper space. Good point. Forgot to mention that to Javier. Yeah. So there again, that's what happens when you don't use individual layers and set them to the color you want um, because it has a default in there. If it knows that you're a model, and you're turning something black, um, it will show it as white so you can see it in model space and vice versa into paper space on separate layers, not changing individual properties um, on a specific layer. Uh, thanks, James, for that. Good reminder on that. So much to know. Um, I had, there was an interview, I was inter on an interview last night about I guess about 6.30 last night uh, for a position on our team as instructor, and um, he was commenting, he was very familiar with Civil 3D, and he, he said, he goes, I don't know everything. He goes, I've been working in Civil 3D for years, um, and I don't know everything in there. So, uh, and the same with AutoCAD, uh, from Autodesk, is, is, and, and a lot of things. I mean, you take Revit, which is, we have three classes on Revit, Revit 1, 2, and 3. And there is so, even after a level three, there's still so much more. It's such a powerful program. There's so much more to, to learn on a lot of the softwares. They build these softwares with anticipation of conquering the world, I guess, is, is, is one way of putting it. But um, just powerful, powerful programs. And they're getting more and more powerful um, in just drawing some lines and assigning some layers, et cetera. So 
All right, and I want to, before I go into this demonstration, I'm kind of putting myself out on a limb here, and I want to demonstrate it so, um, so some of you can see it, and hopefully the right people are in the class that are having any issues. Because I do comment back on uh, returning uh, the drawings to you or your assignments to you. I do comment back. Um, so hopefully this is, either I'm going to find what the problem is, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my, uh, coordinator email um, like I've done before when I did all that testing um, and I'm converted to a JPEG I'll email them my coordinator uh, right here live I'll do it all live I hope I can do it fairly quickly and um, email it from there and then open it in our um, our class email and see if I'm having the same problems I may and I'm glad Kevin's here he can help me uh, figure out the X ref on that but the tests I did, uh, what was it, a week ago or something, figuring this out, it had to be a JPEG. It all worked fine. So I'm, I'm still baffled by what the problem is. I've done some Googling on it. Um, haven't found any any solid solution on that. And Kevin, at any point, if you want to interject uh, while I'm going through this, please do. Um, uh, I appreciate it. And anybody uh, who has any suggestions, either on what I'm doing wrong or the information I'm getting wrong, um, uh, we can discuss as, as I go through this. We have that to go through. I have one comment about careers and interviewing that I discovered yesterday. I want to pass on to you just some tips. And then we have the video to finish up about 10 minutes on that video from irrigation. And then to, to try to finish up this PowerPoint, which I think is about uh, eight, seven or eight PowerPoint slides left. From where we left off yesterday. There's a ton of information in this presentation, and I'm not going to go through every um, every single uh, link that I have in there because there's a lot in there to go through. But I have some, some narrative that explains what's in there. I'm going to leave it up to you to explore it um, when you feel need need to. And of course, you can always save these PowerPoints as well, download them, and you can sell them for a lot of money for free. Uh, you can download them for free and sell them for a lot of money, so you can become wealthy like me. That was a joke. All right. Yeah, James. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and the other thing I, I just made is a uh, look at this work. I apologize for not having that posted Sunday morning. I try to get everything posted by Sunday morning at 5 a.m. Um, and um, I just went ahead and made that uh, video just a few minutes ago. We'll review that. And I have all, I'm posting all the lectures on YouTube as well. Um, and so that's being posted. And then I have this video that we're going to finish up today. It, there's a link also for the video individually if you don't want to go through all these exciting, wonderful PowerPoints. The thing I want to pass on. Um, before we really get into the meat of today is something that, that I discovered yesterday about in the interview and something I really hadn't thought about before. And I guess I should have, you know, being as old as I am, I guess, in as many job interviews as I've gone on in um, different situations, I guess I, I want to pass this on to you just as a heads up. It's just a small tidbit, but it may help you get a job. Um, yesterday, the person interviewing um, uh, let's see what, what um, okay, so I had his resume and I was reviewing his resume while we're doing the interview or I had already reviewed it and I highlighted his resume. And so I was kind of going through the resume while we had three people in on the interview, uh, myself and two others interviewing uh, this person. And one of the things that came to, um, he had a part in there uh, at one of his companies that said, um, I forgot how it was termed, but it had the word training in there. So I picked up on that right away. Oh, training. So how you have a mindset from where you're coming from. So I'm coming from education and training. Immediately, I'm thinking training in AutoCAD or you know whatever field and talking in front of people and showing them how to do things. So I picked up on it and I said, oh, so uh, can you describe the training process that you showed um, in this one company that you work for? He goes, well, I really didn't do any formal training. He goes, um, and the way he, I guess, kind of defended that statement or defended that uh, word was that he showed people 
um, they had problems on the AutoCAD Civil 3D, I think is what we were talking about. So my point is, it wasn't anything against the person that you were interviewing, but my point is, is when you're listing something on your resume, make sure that you're looking at it, you know, and you might consider it, you know, that, that guy might consider that training. Uh, that was something he was training a person how to use this certain function in Civil 3D or how to lay this, this, uh, this drawing out or something like that. He considered that training, but what I want you to point out or what I want you to think about when you write that resume and, and, and you always structure the resume, of course, for the company that you're, or for the type of job you're going for, everybody knows that, but watch out for the verbiage that you put in there uh, because you have to look at all the verbiage from how they are looking at it. Okay, so when they pick up on something because what ended up on this interview yesterday was that one word, I don't want to say it was just that one thing, but that that did not, it was not favorable for him on the interview. Um, there were some other things as well, but that that conversation when I asked him about the training really kind of blew a hole in the, in the side of the ship, I think. Um, so make sure that you're, look, when you put verbiage in, whatever it is, that you're looking at it from company's side um, as as far as a definition and that and that's something I never really considered I I just listed the stuff I did and didn't I mean I considered the company I was going to work for but I didn't look at it from their viewpoint um, as far as technical words or verbiage that they may misconstrued as, as something totally different because they're coming from a, a different angle so just a heads up on a way to fine-tune your resume uh, for for a company I just wanted to pass that on to you. Uh, we talked very little uh, about careers in here. Um, uh, James again says uh, thumbs up on that. Appreciate that, James. I, hopefully that was helpful to, to you and anybody else uh, that may be looking for work eventually. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, okay, thanks, James. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, careers, I think the first week. Um, in my intro classes, we talk a lot more about careers about interviewing process. Of course, when I'm in front of a class, it's a lot easier to, to demonstrate things to do and to not do. Um, I don't cover it a lot in here because most of you, uh, all of you are advanced students. And some of you, uh, I know a few of you in here are already working. I know Kevin won. I think Zach wants another one that's already working. I know there's a few that are already working in industry. So um, that's why I don't cover a lot of career uh, topics in here. But if you want more career information from me, any any advice, I'm not a professional by any means, but I've gone on, I don't know how many um, interviews, I know, not that I lost a lot of jobs, but I go on interviews sometimes just to go on interviews. Uh, and this is in the past, um, to get comfortable on interviewing. And James Meek says, I wish I had taken your inter class, sounds like I missed out, not to, uh, Pre, oh, shame of pre, previous professor. Just yeah, it's different. And a lot, and a lot of you know, a lot of professors and instructors. Yeah, uh, James Meek, you're right. Um, not to put him down, the previous professor at all. Um, they hit the subject and they hit it running right, and they're focused on that. But I know, especially in my intro classes, that um, everybody is taking classes. I mean, there may be one out of. You know, I can think of I can think of maybe one out of ten, eleven years uh, that's taken a class just for the fun of you know uh, pass fail or what do they call credit no credit, um, just for the interest of it. And usually they'll take a CE class in AutoCAD, which doesn't cover as much stuff. But, um, most students, ninety nine point nine percent of the students are determined they're either working in a field and want to improve their skill set. Um, Welders have to take the intro class, so they have to take that class. They have to endure the pain of AutoCAD and me lecturing through that so they can complete, complete their uh, welding degree. Um, that's another maybe exception to it, but they're still interested in getting jobs and they're still interested in uh, interviewing techniques and, and things like that. So um, if any of you have any questions about interviewing, I'm more, more than welcome. Um, more than welcome to send me emails or questions or we can meet in during office hours. Um, I'll help you in any way I can. 
Um, I, I do look, I do scan as the jobs come across and see if they're a fit, you know, for this class. A lot of them are coming through on the mechanical end right now. Not a lot. Uh, it slowed down because of, uh, because of COVID. Um, but um, career wise, I'm here for you. And I tell my intro classes after you finish taking the classes for me, whether it's one or two or three, whatever classes, don't, don't forget about me. I'm here to help you, you know, all the way through into a career. And then after, if, if you need, you know, if you go to a career and start a job, you know, like, you know, I really don't like this company, check back with me. You know, um, you're an alumni of TCC and I'll help you however I can. Uh, the other thing is, too, um, lost the train of thought on that one. There it went. Right on out on uh, job interviewing and career. Oh, um, on uh, looking for jobs as well. Don't, you know, don't get to check with me as you're starting to approach and see what job as you're starting to approach graduation. Um, what uh, fields I might have available for jobs. Um, Iman says, <laughs> "Thank you, Iman. I'm not going to repeat that. That's." Too nice. Uh, he says you're my, I guess I want to repeat it. I lied. Uh, you're my favorite instructor. That's by God's grace. I um, somebody likes me. I'm on. Thank. You. I know other people like me, but um, you talk to my wife, and I'm not the nicest person in the world. So, I'm on. Thank you for that. That really helps. Uh, I learned a lot. Okay, and I, I appreciate that. That really means a lot. That really means a lot to me. Um, of course, evals mean a lot. Comments like that. That means I'm getting through. Um, James McGinn, um, Brittany says ditto. Thank you, Brittany. I, I really, really appreciate those comments from both of you and everybody else who's in the comments like that in the past, either on email or in the chat. Um, it, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> going? Um, yeah, so the course evals helped me a lot. Uh, comments, uh, Jan, oh, that's where I was going. James, um, again. And I had a conversation, lengthy conversation yesterday after class, uh, or right up to when class ended, I believe. And one of the two words that I put in the instructions kind of threw him, and I can totally see how it did. So, and James, um, again, thank you for pointing that out. That helps a lot on how to move forward on classes. Um, this is no excuse, but sometimes when I post these classes and put them together, they're from the previous semesters, I have to reformat them a little bit. Uh, because it applies to this environment, this class, online, et cetera. And it, sometimes it's late in the week or late at night. And when I do that, uh, Thursdays typically I'm working, you know, 15, 16 hour days trying to get everything wrapped up so I don't have so much to do on Friday. Um, so that that's part of it. I'm not making excuses, but that's part of the reasoning. I just don't catch little words. Thanks for students like you, James, um, that pointed that out um, as well. Uh, James Meek says, my previous instructor was amazing, and you are the same. But, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, James Meek. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah it, it's sometimes uh, James Meek and everybody, uh, instructors can make a break it, right? Um, it can be the most interesting subject, and you're fired up about it, and the instructor's delivery or methods uh, just really shoot a hole in it and make it a big struggle through the semester. So, um, yeah, and I'm blessed to have every one of you in this class. I tell you, it's a great class. I'm really enjoying it, minus the technical stuff that we'll get into in a second. So. Yeah. Uh, that's right. What I think is very interesting is the style you teach is very similar to the professor I had before. And I did amazing when I was in person class with him. And when it was, when I started having hybrid classes with him, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, when I started having hybrid classes with him, uh, he, uh, it, it got a little different. And I, I'm kind of getting this, like same vibe that like uh, most of us would be doing like uh, a little bit better if we actually were in class with you instead of online. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, 
Because I, I mentally I go down a road trying to explain something, um, you know, before I say it. And the verbiage is like I'm in class in front of you, so I have to change that up. Or if I miss changing it up, I'm sure it comes across kind of diluted. Um, it doesn't have the same emphasis or the same power as in class. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's it's a it's a real challenge. And I agree with a lot of you. And I know James, both James is up. Um, Especially James again, I, I know his, his voice this way back because I've had him for a couple classes when we transitioned for on online um, the, the 1409 online. Uh, he prefers um, it face to face, and so you know we all try to get better, right? I mean we have to adjust the environment. Um, we can't. What is the saying? We uh, forget what you can't uh, can't control. Just focus on what you can control. Um, James Meek, thank you for those uh, comments. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so what, I, I'm going to transition now. So thank you for all the compliments and all the suggestions. I'm always open for those. I don't care uh, how they are. Um, you know, just hold back the profanity. If you can use some other words or something. I, I have never had that. Um, somebody yell at me about that. But. Suggestions are always, always welcomed. Um, back to Kevin helping me out yesterday. Um, and James, uh, James Meek uh, had some great suggestions yesterday. And James McGinn, uh, as we talked yesterday, with some great suggestions, or not in suggestions, but he really pointed out uh, some great ideas on how to uh, better verbalize something. You have to pay, and this is, I'm talking to myself, I have to pay. Maybe it's out to everybody. You have to pay to such detail um, in verbiage, whether it's you're verbally saying it or written, um, because back to that interview thing, that one word and that <clears throat> excuse me in that interview uh, kind of threw that whole interview in a different direction. So uh, we have to really pay attention to that. And it's not so much, I know you guys can see me, you're probably sick of seeing me, but you know, you can see some body language. I'm, I'm fairly animated in class. Um, I pace a lot in class. Uh, fortunately, we have swivel chairs in the classroom, so students can swivel back and forth. Because the podium, I don't know why they set it up this way, but I kind of like it now. The podium is in the back of the class, the screens are in the front of the class, and I don't use a remote clicker because I like, I like to walk around. I like to get you know, somewhat close to people and see their expressions and and if I'm a little hard of hearing and they're a little soft spoken, whatever it is, I get a little closer. So I'm very animated in class and that helps I think a lot uh, with the expression and with the direction, but um, in here in this little box. Uh, I saw one presentation, this guy, this professor at a university was talking about online delivery. And he had a super camera, a mic, of course, and he was standing probably about you know, four or five feet back. And he had this huge digital touch screen presentation monitor. And then he had a whiteboard set up next to it. And you know, you could do drawings on this huge screen. How cool is that? But that's a whole budget that thing. Okay. So let's talk about Google Maps. And before I pull up Google Maps and start showing the or go through the process, I'm not showing it to you, but I just want to see what what the heck's going on with this process. Um, and I apologize. I guess I apologize for taking the time up to do this, but this is the only way I can figure out. You guys can give me some interaction uh, for those of you who are having uh, that I return comments on assignments that are you know, saying, "Hey, you know, your map was not showing." Now, to let you know, because of the problems that have come up on packet four, I'm sorry, packet three, and I made comments, I told, uh, if the map wasn't showing up, I told you in there, I wasn't taking off the points for the map not showing up. We haven't figured it out that that map showed up. So one side note before I get into Google Maps. Uh, we talked about how difficult um, it was to see our Rotunda garden project uh, because we can't get on campus. Uh, we have limited photos, um, et cetera. And so we talked about doing the street view, dropping the little guy. I don't think he goes on campus. I don't think they probably have uh, Google on campus. 
So I was always thinking about that. You might try for your perspective drawing, you might try Google Earth. That's actually in 3D and you can manipulate, you should be able to manipulate it to see it on campus. So Google Earth is another um, resource. And I don't know how that works with uh, snipping out of that and scaling. I don't know how all that, that's a whole other realm I haven't experimented with. So you can see I, I'm kind of pushing myself as far as uh, technology. I don't know all of it, but I'm making some suggestions. because I know a lot of you are very uh, techie Kabe. So um, anyway, that's another suggestion. So let's go to, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here in a second. As soon as I get to CCC. Off campus, just when I think I have everything, you know, pulled up and ready for presentation, I realize I don't have it. All right, so let me share this. I'll stop sharing this. All right, so you should be able to see. Okay, there you go. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, Iman says, is Google Earth updated? Um, great question. I don't know. Probably not. Great point, Iman. But Maybe you could manipulate it around so you could see one of the buildings that would help you with your perspective. Um, just a thought. All right. Um, any tools that you can use? Um, and you know, I, I I don't know if I mentioned this before at the start of class, the start of the semester, but you guys can help each other out. I don't want you switching or exchanging files. Um, I, you know, that's called cheating, but. As far as technology or making suggestions, um, how many of you have ever seen, uh, what is it called, Amazing Race? Anybody in that movie, show, the show, I'm sorry. Right, James Meek says yes. So um, on that, there's teams and they travel around the world. It's really, I think it's really interesting. You get to see some parts of the world you may have never seen. Um, and they have these teams, usually it's, uh, you know, Boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband, wife, or uh, on there right now there's two football players um, named up, and they they compete to do a, a, an event uh, or a series event to what place they come in in that event, and then they see I forgot how much it's worth. Uh, um, oh, and James said the one with twins. Yeah, I think that's the one we're watching right now with twins. But anyway, so. Um, they uh, some of some of the teams form alliances where they they help them out as far as not doing it like this one they were putting together out of a dump we're making musical instruments this, I think this was last week and so they had the parts they were supposed to find out of the dump they had pictures of it, an example of it so they pulled these parts out of this trash heap and um, then they start assembling it well it was very difficult to assemble to say the least. And so one team that formed an alliance or a couple teams, they would just say, make suggestions. Oh, you have to do this first. Where the other teams are like, you know, they're kind of ticked off at them because they have some hard times or whatever. My point is, you guys can form, you know, I don't want you to be exclusive or inclusive of your group, but um, you guys are welcome to, to share how you did things. Or you know, like Iman just said, is Google Earth updated? So maybe you'll find out not. And then, but she'll find a better way to maybe do that two point perspective or information to get on that. So, um, so I, I encourage that because when you go to work, you work as teams, you don't work in this silo. I don't care if you have this separate cubicle. Um, and James Meek says Google Earth doesn't zoom in as far as I like. Yeah. So um, there are some drawbacks, right? And so, anyway. Just some suggestions. Work as teams uh, to figure these things out. I'm here as a resource, but as you can tell, I don't know everything. All right, so here's the here's the map, and we will go ahead and turn the slide on. And again, here is our rotunda area, and then we'll pull up snip, and we will snip the area. And then 
so something like this. All right, so now we're going to, as soon as we do that, we're going to just save the file. File and then save as. And now this one defaults to JPEG, but if, if you do it for the first time, this is where you have to watch it. Uh, PN, PNG is what we were get, I was getting a lot of that did not have the map attached. I'm getting some GIF files as well. So make sure, um, I, I don't remember if I can get H, uh, HTML files or not, but make sure it's on JPEG. So um, those of you who are having issues, make sure that's number one. So immediately do a save as, make sure it's JPEG, and then where you're going to send it at. And right now it says go to the desktop on this PC. And I'm just going to go ahead and name this the date. I'll just put that in for real quick. And hit save. All right. So we know it's there. Now, the other thing that might be happening, it just hit me. If, let's see if this will work. I click and I, I didn't I didn't open up. I did a save as and I'm going to do a copy right from here. Let's should have AutoCAD open. And we'll right click and let's see what happens on the page. Oh, and that's another thing too. I'm getting some maps that are not true north. Remember, north is to the top of the page. And there is that. And so Let's go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and email this um, this file. Let me do a file save as on this and get this separate. And I'll send this to the desktop again. And I'm going to rename this and I'll just put this uh, test 11 uh, 10. Save it. All right. Minimize that. Get to my email, my school email, and do new. Here's a email from my boss. Boss. What's going on there? Um, and then I'm going to send that to our school address, and I'll put test. And attach go to my desktop and it was what was it test one ten and just out of curiosity let's down the control key and I can should be able to load both of those just out of curiosity. Oh but this is the bad one. 122. Do one more attachment here. Or uh eleven yes, eleven ten. There we go. Attach that. Alright, so that's the DWG. This is the JPEG there. I'm just going to see how they they go. This may take a second or two. Not only to load onto the email, to actually send and make it with it. We go to do. And and we'll go over to our school email. I saw that flash. You guys went away for a second. Hopefully, you're still there. It says I'm connected. All right, so it's going to take uh, lost for a second. Okay, but I'm still there. Okay, thanks, James and James. You guys are on. Oh, there you go. Okay, popped up. All right, cool. So let's see. Now, my AutoCAD, for some reason, it will not open right from here. Um, when I click on the DWG, I have to download it. And then I have to go to AutoCAD, and then I have to go to Open. Pain in the tail. I don't know why. And it tells me I, I need to re-download it. And I'm not going to do it at this point. But 
that could be disastrous. Um, so, what am I doing? Um, lost my train of thought while I was talking. Oh, I'm going to go to Dallas. Here we go. Um, sorry, guys. Dealing with somebody is old. I might talk at the same time and get this PC. Downloads, open that, and always put your initials in there. All right. That's another thing I have in my notes. Make sure you put your initials in your to everybody. Even if you're doing it, you can ignore this. At least your initials in your cat in your files, all your files. Obviously, here I didn't, so shame on me. Um, but here's the test, the DW, uh, the DF, the DWG test. Open it. So there's my J, JPEG. It should show up on the D sheet as well. I mean, there shouldn't be any reason it doesn't. So obviously, it still has to be scaled and, and all that stuff, but I just emailed it to myself. So this has been recorded. For those of you who have it, that you're receiving comments back, make sure you check all these steps. Now, I copied right from the saved file. I did a save as, and but I didn't go and open that file. It was saved as a JPEG. So, um, and and I stopped there because the, the other way I usually have done it just for safety is I have closed this guy, and then I would go to my file folder. This is before, you know, just making sure everything was there and looking good. I go to my file folder, which is the desktop, and there it is, the snip of that. And I would open that up um, and then copy from that. So I was just wondering if it made a difference, you know, where do you copy from? So, um, and uh, Kevin, I know you don't like to uh, talk too much or if you want to comment in the box, but. Is there anything uh, wrong or different that I did that you would suggest? If you if you want to turn on your mic or comment in the box, that, that's great. In the chat box, that's great. But that's the way I've done it. It's working for me. That's why I don't understand on the other side of we're having issues. So, and Kevin, if you don't want to, you don't have to. I didn't see anything. I mean, if it works, right? Um... I can't tell if it's pulling up from the downloads or pulling up because it's already on your computer, the picture, I mean. Great point, great point, because the, the file is on my computer, right? Yeah. So, the so it may be associating with yeah. that. So the real test would be for me to email it and open my laptop and see if it opens up, right? Uh, well, I guess you can delete the picture and then try and open it up. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I'm saying if I if I email it, then open the email on my on my uh, laptop. I don't have the download there on my laptop, so we can see if it's uh, if it's still referencing in that way. So, good point. Yeah. Good point on that. Um. So. With that said, uh, well, I got you, Kevin. Um, if I could, I don't know if I have a file open that I can find real quick. Maybe I can do it on this one. So when I get a blank, uh, a blank, no, this is going to work. Um, when this is blank and it just has the outline, Kevin, and then I go to the uh, extra reference. Let me see. I can't do it because I don't have one of those open. Um, I'll have to talk to you later about that, how to get that pathway uh, redefined. Because I tried it and it didn't didn't cooperate with me, but um, maybe we can talk at some other point on that. Yeah, okay. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and then, uh, have you before I come to your comment, um, so anybody, for those of you who are successful in doing this, um, do you see anything different that I did? Um, ones that are, are having, that are not receiving comments back from me about the map not being in there 
Did you see anything different that I did that, that what you do? Anybody? All right. Okay. So no comments on that. Um, and okay. And James McGinn says not really. Okay. Um, all right. So how they are, uh, this was, we were talking about problems with uh, the map import. So I'm not going to go back over it again. Um, and the uh, recording, I'd encourage you to watch the recording um, of today's, uh, of this first part, especially. Because um, I just went through a whole map import uh, doing um, doing email, and Kevin made a point that maybe it's because I'm on the same um, uh, machine that it's pulling up. Um, yeah, so try to watch that. And also, Javier, I, I did address the uh, the blackout that you're getting um, on on your PDF. And James Meek says, make sure, because one of the things you're not doing, are, if you don't mind me pointing this out, and I talked to the class about it, make, for everybody, make sure you're using separate layers. Because um, on your files, the way it looked like, what I could pick up on your DWG file, if you had like two or three, maybe four layers, and but you're not separating everything out, you're changing the colors on the layers an item uh, the properties the color within the properties so that might be confusing it is one thing and the other thing is james um uh meek said was that you might have something turned white or black is showing up in black in the pdf and that's blacking everything out it was turned black on your in your DWG as far as a color and but it has an auto correct in AutoCAD that it shows as it's white even so you have it chosen black or a dark color and then you PDF it doesn't have that auto correct so check those things out the things we talked about have you and hopefully that will help you and anybody else that's having the same same problem on that um, oh, you did <laughs> five hours. Wow, you did not get a lot of sleep. Okay, no problem being late either. That's why we have the recordings. That's one of the beauty of online uh, lecturing. So, all right, good job, Javier. You figured it out. So, anybody else is having issues, um, I will start marking off going forward now um, on this issue here. All right, so I think we have that resolved. All right, timing away here. Let me stop showing this. And we will go now over to where we left off yesterday for the, uh, the YouTube. Uh, Larry said, True North, why? Well, typically, um, Sheets are orient, oriented uh, in industry with north to the top of the page. So there is enough room to orient this map to not true north, but just with north in the top of the page, because true north is slightly off of that map. Now, if you want to do a true north and figure all that out, uh, you can align the map to a true north if you want to. Um, I think it's about 22. Maybe it's a little more than that, 25 degrees towards the west um, map rotation. I forgot that number. But the reason that you say, why, Larry? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going down the wrong road. Okay. You want to turn your mic on, Larry? Um, I think you're, I don't mean true north like magnetic north. I just meant, can't you like point it where it would normally be east and just call it north? Problem is, it's not industry standard. And nobody likes that. Uh, correct on that. Um, so okay. here, here's the deal. Yes, you can do that. Very absolutely, and you can do that in this class. And I see where you're going because you'll get a little more visual because of the horizontal picture, the way it's formatted, right? Yeah, that in, in such case, yeah. In this case, right? 
And so as long as it's called out in there, um, and as long as, now let's talk about industry for a second, as long yeah. as the person doesn't miss it, right? They miss the north arrow, the, the indicator. Um, it's just typically set up that way so there's not any errors um, in assumption. So Okay, I, I won't do that, but I was just wondering. Yeah, and, and again, you or anybody else, you're welcome to do that as long as you have that north. You should have the north arrow in there. Um, on the plot plan as well, and um, on anything else that you draw. So let, let's say you draw a landscape plan with north to the top of the page, and then you do your plot plan, and you have the north arrow, and you got it turned sideways. That's going to be confusing to people. They're like, okay, I got myself oriented this way on on the on the site map this way. Now I look over the landscape plan, and I'm okay. I think I can kind of get it figured out. So anytime, this gets back to print reading, anytime you can create clarity or emphasize clarity, you increase readability, re increase readability, uh, decreases the chances for error. So you're just trying to narrow it down. Larry, great point. Yes, you can, even in this class, as long as it's called. Good point. All right. Uh, so let's share this. Love the comments, guys. I love it. You have no idea how lonely it is sitting over here talking to this box. And you guys are commenting really good. Javier says, but I still need to separate all layers so I can see all the information that is needed. Yes, use layers. As James Meek says, before you came, Javier, layers are your friend. Layers are your friend. Multiple, multiple layers. Uh, Kevin. Put in the chat box what the average number of layers that you use um, in industry when you're working. Just the average number. Um, average number? I mean, when we open up a, a new drawing and start a new drawing, it comes with, I mean, the template that we open up is like 470 something layers, <laughs> and we always add to it. <laughs> oh, I was way off. I was going to say, yeah, I bet you at least 200. <laughs> Oh, yeah, at least 300. All right, Kevin. Yeah, so you guys have a template. You open up. It has the standard layers that you guys use. And then depending on the project, you may add additional layers for clarity. So, um, yeah, so James Meek said, yeah, hundreds. Uh, and 400. That, uh, Kevin, thank you for that. The 400 category is what we would get from in a survey company when we import an actual drawing. It would have upwards of four or five hundred layers, and it, it is. We don't need as much information. Just send us what we need. So um, that, that was part of the problem. We had one template for all all of our departments. So there was uh, uh, survey layers. There were you know MEP layers all on those same template. Okay. Yeah. It. it that, and that, that's one area to me. I, I think that they should have some kind of control on because that does not add clarity to what you're working on, but that's just my two cents worth. <laughs> so, all right, Kevin, thank you. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, so layers don't have to be different colors. James um, says, uh, James Meek says, yeah, they don't have to be different colors. They, it's just convenient for control. But as we get into landscaping, you want different colors. Don't, don't change the layers of the individual or don't change the color of the individual items. Use those if you have petunias and you're going to make them all yellow. Uh, put them on one layer, make that layer yellow called petunias. Uh, Larry, go ahead. Um, regarding the irrigation pipes, yes. the PVC stuff? Yes. I've dealt with this before. You can bend those slightly, I mean, as long as they're long enough. Just curve them a little bit, right? They yeah, all have to be straight. It depends on the radius. If you have like a, uh, a I don't want to say, uh, there goes my screen blank again. If you have like a circular driveway uh, that has a really big radius, like a 200 foot radius, um, yeah, it will bend around around that a cur curve. Uh, you don't have to put. Um, they have 30 degree. I think they have 30 degree. They have 45, and I think they even have a 
30 degree angle piece for PVC. You don't have to go through all that. It will curve to answer your question, uh, Larry. Well, I, my, my sidewalk has a slight little wriggle, wiggle in it. And I can just kind of bend them a little bit and they'll fit right in. Okay. I think. Um, yeah, is that okay to do it that way or do I need them all? Just well, it depends on the degree of the bend. Um, you know, it, yeah. it really does. So it's just a little um, bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little bit at 90 degrees, it's not going to bend like that. So um, if you have less than. I mean, you know, from joint to joint. You know, yeah. So how, how long is it from joint to joint? It's like 10 feet and then. I need it to bend, you know, like maybe 10 degrees at the most. Right, right. Would that work? 10 feet, 10, uh, 10 degrees, yeah, that should work. Yeah. I mean, I know it will in real life, but I'm just asking, is that okay? <laughs> it, it, it will in real life, it will pass with me then. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay, then. All right, cool. <laughs> Good comment. Good comment. I'm having technical issues here while I'm talking to Larry. Um, for some reason, the uh, YouTube that it was just I had pre pulled up, ready to go for you guys, decided it didn't want to function. So let me relaunch it. Triangular spacing is more. The triangular spacing. All right. Now we got it back. So let me get rid of this. And reshare. I think we had some other comments coming here. Um, uh, James begins that. Is there any way you can get uh, the person on campus to take a picture of the rotundra looking north? Well, we have some of those. Um, uh, actually, James, uh, look at that map. He took them from the north looking south and from the south looking north on that info I sent out. Um, on some of the attachments. So take a look at that and see. I know they're not the greatest pictures, uh, but it's really hard to direct somebody from here on how to pictures. Um, okay, and you sent a picture of the Rotunda. Uh, so how did that, James, how did that uh, picture look? I'm gonna open it up right now, but how'd that look? Turn out pretty good. Sure. Not too detailed, and the rotunda is still there. <laughs> yeah, um, that was just a suggestion. So, um, does anyone own a plane? Um, okay, that's what that's what you sent. Um, somebody in here, and I can't remember if it was Zach or somebody has a drone, but they're working on their pilot's license. Um, yeah, government flight space. Yeah, because of the prison. Etc. So, yeah, that I guess that's out. So, all right, guys, it'll be a challenge, right? Opportunity. We'll work at it, and I will take it into consideration as well for your two-point perspective. It is a challenge. It is COVID. It is online, and <laughs> Ninja on campus. Yeah, uh, somebody tried that, and it didn't work out too good. I won't say who it was. So. All right, let's uh, rock and roll on this. Now this is going to pick up where we left off uh, yesterday, so about halfway through it. Um, I'll rewind it just a little bit, and we will continue on. And I will be back. We'll be back in session right after this. Wonderful message from your sponsor. Calculate runtimes for the controller. All of the sprinklers on a particular zone must have the same precipitation rate to water evenly. On a typical performance chart, the precipitation rate is given both for square spacing and triangle spacing. This refers to the way that the sprinklers are laid out. Square spacing refers to a grid of squares with sprinkler heads at each corner. 
Triangular spacing refers to a grid of equilateral triangles with sprinkler heads at each corner. Triangular spacing is more efficient and has higher precipitation rates. Operating range. Each sprinkler type works best within a limited range of operating pressures. While the pressure of an irrigation system is in many ways determined by the location, you can add pressure to a system with a booster pump and regulate pressure with pressure regulating valves and sprinkler heads. Once the design is complete, we will calculate the operating pressure at the last head to ensure that it is operating within the recommended range. Now let's take a quick look at each type of sprinkler. Rotors come in different sizes with different radius ranges. Many rotors generally have an 18 to 36 foot radius range. Standard residential rotors typically have a 22 to 50 foot radius range, and sports field rotors generally throw water between 45 and 75 feet. Now that's what I call a home run. <laughs> Sorry. The radius range is affected both by the water pressure at the sprinkler head and the size of the nozzle used. Motor flow rates and precipitation rates vary quite significantly depending on which nozzle you use. A standard residential rotor will have different nozzles with flow rates ranging from 0.5 to 6 gallons per minute and precipitation rates from 0.15 inches per hour to about 0.8 inches per hour. Determining precipitation rates for rotors involves an extra step in the calculation. The precipitation rates listed here on the chart are based on a half circle rotor. However, if your plan calls for a full circle spray pattern, the rotor will only go over the full circle area once in the same amount of time that a rotor spraying in a half circle spray pattern would water its spray area twice. Now this means that to calculate the precipitation rate for the rotor adjusted to a full circle arc, you will need to divide the precipitation rate on the chart by two. Similarly, if a rotor is adjusted to a quarter circle pattern, you will need to multiply the precipitation rate by two. Now this has consequences for your choice of nozzle and how you zone the rotors. If there is a mixture of spray patterns on a rotor zone, you will need to choose nozzles that ensure that the precipitation rate for each rotor is the same. For instance, if you use a number 3.0 nozzle on a quarter circle rotor, you'll need a number 6.0 nozzle for a half circle rotor on the same zone in order to match the precipitation rates of the rotors. In general, rotor precipitation rates are lower than those of fixed sprays, so it is not a good idea to mix rotors and sprays on a single zone. Rotors operate best between 30 and 60 PSI. Commercial rotors will perform at pressures up to 70 PSI, and athletic rotors require pressures between 40 and 80 PSI to operate. The term fixed spray refers to all spray heads with nozzles that emit a fixed fan of water over the watering area. Depending on the nozzle used, a fixed spray will have a radius from 6 to 18 feet. Flow rates depend on the radius and the arc spread, ranging from 1.5 to 6 gallons per minute. Big sprays automatically match precipitation rates based on how large the arc is and have much greater precipitation rates than rotors, ranging from just over 1 to just over 2 inches per hour. Big sprays operate best between 20 and 50 psi. Rotary nozzles are installed in spray heads and have the low precipitation rates of rotors, but work in smaller areas like fixed sprays. A rotary nozzle radius ranges from 13 to 30 feet, uses between 0.2 and 4 gallons per minute, and has precipitation rates around half an inch per hour. Rotary nozzles operate extremely consistently between 30 and 50 psi. There are a number of specialty nozzles, bubblers, and other add-ons to an irrigation system designed to solve particular problems. Big sprays and rotary nozzles both have side strip and end strip nozzles that water thin rectangular areas about 5 feet wide and 15 feet long. This is a great solution for the strip of grass between a sidewalk and the road. Bubblers can be used to supply supplemental water to trees or other individual plants with particular water needs. Operating ranges vary based on the nozzle. And finally, micro or drip irrigation can be used to provide water to landscape beds, ground cover, or sparsely planted areas. 
This irrigation method relies on the use of many small emitters with a very small radius, including drip emitters, drip bubblers, or micro sprays. There are two main types. Inline drip irrigation, where the emitters are built into the tubing, and point source drip irrigation, where individual emitters are punched into the tubing by the plant. With inline drip irrigation, flow rates can be calculated per foot of tubing, and precipitation rates are very low from 0.15 to about 1.5 inches per hour. With point source irrigation, flow rates are calculated per emitter and precipitation is measured in gallons per day per plant instead of inches per hour. The operating range for most micro or drip irrigation is 15 to 25 PSI. All right, let's get back to our design here. Because of the large areas of turf in the front and the back, rotors are a natural choice for these areas. The strip in the front is quite narrow. It is surrounded by concrete and the street on either side. Spray nozzles will work best in this area. Side yards are also narrow, but it's best to use rotary nozzles here. And we'll go ahead and install inline drip irrigation in the landscape bed. That's a good general game plan. But now it's time to specify the details. Which sprinkler? With which nozzle? And what flow and precipitation rate? To begin, let's consider the last piece of information we talked about gathering at your site visit. The soil type. Soil type matters a lot when you're installing drip irrigation because water travels very differently in different soil types. In clay soil, water spreads out and infiltrates the soil slowly. 0.1 to 0.4 inches per hour. In loamy soil, water spreads out and down more evenly and infiltrates the soil more quickly, about 0.3 to 0.9 inches per hour. And in sandy soil, water quickly drains downward, infiltrating the soil at 0.7 to 1.25 inches per hour. It is best to choose sprinklers with precipitation rates that do not exceed the soil infiltration rate. Another important consideration is the grade of the property. When watering on slopes, you need to be attentive to the effects of gravity and potential problems with runoff. So it is important to use lower precipitation rates and either increase spacing as you move down the hill or eliminate sprinkler heads at the bottom altogether. The key idea in sprinkler layout is head-to-head -head spacing. Now, what do I mean by that? When laying out the sprinklers, the radius of one sprinkler should reach the head of the sprinkler next to it. The maximum allowable distance between sprinklers is 120% of the sprinkler radius. There are two basic styles of head-to-head -head spacing. Triangular spacing, which is the most efficient spacing method, and square spacing. In the case of triangular spacing, the sprinklers are laid out at corners of equilateral triangles in a triangular grid with each side of the triangle less than or equal to 120% of the sprinkler radius. In the case of square spacing, the sprinklers are laid out at the corners of squares in a grid. Square spacing is less efficient than triangular spacing. There is a weak spot in the middle of the square, so each side of the square should be less than or equal to 110% of the sprinkler radius. Sprinkler spacing should be reduced in sites with a prevailing wind over 4 miles per hour. For triangular spacing, a prevailing wind of 4 to 7 miles per hour dictates a maximum spacing of 110% of the radius, and a prevailing wind of 8 to 12 miles per hour requires a maximum spacing of 100% of the radius. For square spacing, spacing should not exceed 100% of the radius in areas with winds from 4 to 7 miles per hour or 90% of the radius for areas with winds of 8 to 12 miles per hour. When laying out the sprinkler heads on the plan, be sure to indicate the sprinkler type, nozzle size, and flow rate for each sprinkler head. The limiting factor on the size of zone is the number of gallons per minute the sprinkler heads on that zone consume. You should design zones to use no more than 80% of the system capacity as determined above. So, for our example, that's 80% of 9 gallons per minute, or 7.2 gallons per minute. Consulting specifications for a 1-inch valve, we can see that this is well within its operating range. 
Start creating zones by grouping the sprinkler heads in each watering area together. If the total number of gallons per minute in the watering area is greater than 7.2, divide that area into multiple zones. Connect sprinklers with lines to indicate the pipe layout and draw in a valve indicating the zone number, valve size, and flow rate. Each zone must connect to a main line that runs from the point of connection to the final valve. Where possible, group valves together into manifolds for ease of installation and maintenance. It's much easier to locate and service a group of three valves than to find each one individually in the yard. The next step is to determine pipe size. The phenomenon that governs pipe size is friction loss. This is a loss of water pressure due to the friction created as water moves through the pipe. Pipe sizing affects friction loss in this way. When relatively little water is moving through a large pipe, water moves very slowly with minimal friction that has very little effect on the pressure at the end of the pipe. On the contrary, when a large amount of water moves through a relatively small pipe, water moves quickly and this generates a lot, a lot of friction, which reduces the pressure at the end of the pipe. To properly size the pipe, you'll need a pipe chart and two simple rules. Keep the velocity below five feet per second and count flow rate from the end of the line backwards. You'll notice on the pipe chart that some values are darker than others. The line between them is at 5 feet per second. This is the point where the velocity causes friction loss too high for efficient system design. This means if you're using 1 inch class 200 pipe, you'll have 5 rotors with a number 3.0 nozzles at 50 psi using 2.7 gallons per minute each. That's 13.5 gallons per minute and within the acceptable flow range of the pipe but six sprinkler heads would be too many. That would be a total of 16.2 gallons per minute, which would create a velocity of over five feet per second. In this case, use one and a quarter inch pipe for the first sprinkler head. It's at the first sprinkler head that 16.2 gallons per minute are flowing through the pipe. After that head takes its 2.7 gallons per minute, the next five heads are only used 13 and a half gallons per minute and you're free to step down to one inch pipe at that point. When feeding pipe to a zone, it is best to feed the line from the valve to the center of the zone so that there is less friction loss than there would be at the last sprinkler of a long end fed run. T and H pattern layouts are common in sprinkler design for precisely this reason. When sizing pipe, always begin with the last head. Determine the minimum pipe size necessary to maintain a velocity below 5 feet per second at the flow rate of that sprinkler. Then move to the next sprinkler head. Add the two flow rates together to get a new flow rate and find the right pipe size for the new flow rate. Evaluate the pipe size at each new sprinkler head. Once the pipes are laid out and sized, make sure that the system will operate properly by calculating the friction loss to the furthest sprinkler head. Start at the last head in the largest zone and multiply the friction loss value by the table by the length of the pipe, then divide by 100. All right, hang in there, we're almost done. There are just a few more details to consider before the plan is complete and ready for installation. You'll need to identify the point of connection, valve locations, and the location for the controller and any sensors on the system. Local codes determine where you are allowed to connect to the water line on the property. Other considerations about the point of connection include where the meter is located and the easiest access point for tapping into the water line. Identify the point of connection on your plan and then route this pipe to the location of the backflow preventer. The backflow preventer should be placed in an easy to access place for testing and maintenance purposes. But that is still out of view, like find a tree or a shrub pretty common. The main line then continues around the property to reach all valve locations. Finally, indicate on your plan the location of the controller and any sensors on the system. When locating the controller, you'll need to place it near a power source, but also in a location that is not landlocked by concrete so that you would not be able to feed the control wires directly into the ground. 
When locating rain or solar sensors, be sure that there are no tree branches or other obstructions that will prevent them from working. And make sure that they are high enough to be affected by the sprinklers themselves. If there are any soil moisture sensors, identify a representative location for each sensor. And we're done. Congratulations, this completes the design of a basic residential irrigation system. Your plan is now complete and you are ready to install. Go get your hands dirty. All right, so we're back, and I know that was a lot of information, and a lot of you are just going, I don't know, just way too much work. So with that said, this is just to give you a general idea what goes into, I guess it's more than a general idea what goes into sprinkler planning, but hopefully you could extract some information out of that. If oh, I'm still recording, okay. Extract some information out of that that will be helpful for your sprinkler layout. Uh, the biggest thing is that you probably picked up some terminology between the lecture and here. Um, so we'll move ahead. From that said, James Meek says, why more math than the brain is prepared to deal with today? Yeah, today and yesterday, right? That was a lot of math. Thank goodness for charts. Um, charts come in really handy. And um, this is really, it's, it is a whole science behind laying this out. A lot of calculations, but where these really come into play are in commercial areas and in athletic fields. Um, this is where when you have these long runs and different pipe sizes, uh, they really have to get these calculations right um, because it really is dependent on a good looking turf. All right. From that, it is. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, James Meek says, why don't you consult a hydrologist? <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't pay for that, that's for sure. Figure it out on your own. You don't have that much at risk, um, just maybe some aggravation. And just a side note, um, I've gone against quite a few of the rules they had on here and kind of a few rules we mentioned because of cost and maybe laziness. Uh, I've tied in systems, a drip system into the lawn irrigation, for example. Um, it's working, it does fine, um, but it's not the best method. So there's a lot of things to consider. This is a, obviously a new system being put in, not a reno or a revamp system, uh, renovation system, um, which some of you might be faced with. So, all right, uh, James says drip system is one of the, the best uh, yeah, Larry says, Ooh, glad my front yard is small. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm glad, Larry, I'm glad you got that tractor. I think that's a, that's a great way to go. But um, with our, for our class, you will have to design this. Don't worry about the calculations. I talked about size pipes already, suggested on use. Just make sure we're calling them out. It is one, almost 150. Come back at 2 o'clock uh, for uh, take a 10 minute break. Um, and James is glad, glad not doing the backyard. Yeah, I hear you on that. All right, come back at two. O'clock. I'll see you then. Post any questions, and we will continue on. Have you are? I'll come back to you. At, uh, go ahead and post any questions that you have. I'll come right back after the break. 